Good afternoon and thank you all for joining us. Let me introduce myself. My name is Ben and I have a background in health sciences and I've been part of the XR Health team since late last year. We are here for our fourth webinar today of our series of webinars where we will cover virtual reality and its emerging role in healthcare. Today, we will be focusing on how virtual reality and physiotherapy can help in managing chronic pain. It is a pleasure for me to introduce you to our lead physiotherapist, Tung, who will be the main speaker for today. Over to you, Tung. Oops, where's my thing gone? Sorry, guys. There we go. That was a bit odd. All right. So thanks very much for the intro, Ben. Um, before we do get started, I wanted to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We we'll also like to pay our respect to the elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation, and extend that respect to all other Indigenous Australians. So yeah, uh, my name is Tung. I'm the lead physiotherapist for XR Health. I've been a physio now for, ooh, I think, about nine years or so, and with XR Health for uh, coming up on four years now, um, and really been loving my job, just being able to combine my my work as well as my passions in uh, technology and playing games so really a match made in heaven so real quick uh you may have already gone uh i may have already told you a bit about this if you've been to our other webinars but xr health is an international company we have uh, divisions in australia the us israel and spain roughly divided up into the clinic so what I do um, seeing clients day to day. And then the other side of things being the product development, actually, you know, uh, updating the headsets and, and creating games, that sort of thing. So today, all going to be about chronic pain. So we're going to cover off a few different things. The first one being is what is chronic pain? So how does it um, affect our brain and our nerve function? And, you know, how is that different to uh, non-chronic pain? Uh, as well as the physiotherapy management of chronic pain? And then how does virtual reality enhanced physio work and then lead to, uh, in some cases, uh, a lot of cases, better outcomes? And there will also be uh, time for questions at the end. So we, we are going to get into some relatively complex sort of uh, mechanisms of, of how pain functions, but hopefully... I'll be able to simplify things for you. And it's really important to understand uh, the basics first to, to really be able to know how do we help manage it. So first of all, what is pain? Uh, it's an experience or an output felt when a person is in danger. So, um, you know, when I cut my finger, I'm, I'm in danger, right? My tissue has been damaged um, I'm, I'm feeling pain because I'm in danger and, you know, I've hurt myself. So the, the point of that pain though, is to motivate you to take action against that danger and protect yourself. So, um, like if I am near a hot fire while I'm cooking and I burn myself, I'm immediately going to take my hand away and to try and protect myself. So, um, that's, the, the main point of feeling that pain. It's an, it's an alarm system. How does that work though? Um, at a, at a really like, you know, um, microscopic sort of level, we we've got sensors all throughout our body. Um, so all literally everywhere, all the way, you know, from our, the top of our head down to our little toes and they're designed to be able to, to send signals or information around, uh, mechanical pressure. So I can feel when I squeeze my hand like this temperature changes. We feel when we're hot and cold as well as chemical changes. So that can be things like, um, inflammation. You know, we can feel those senses that, that chemical change. So in the step-by-step -step of how we actually experience pain, our senses will activate from some kind of stimulus. So say in that example of burning my finger, uh, there's been a temperature change and my senses activate. That temperature change is going to then go from my fingertips all the way to my spinal cord. Then the spinal cord will send that information up to my brain. 
my brain will then evaluate the information. So that's evaluating the information against my own memory, um, the emotional context, the consequences, and then actually do the reasoning. So that's the point in time where all of my past experiences is going to uh, inform what my brain will then do. Um, once the brain has taken in that information from uh, the spinal cord, uh, all of the, the past memories, etc., it will then decide it's a real thing, like a real danger, and then that will lead to me experiencing pain. Now, now that we know how pain generally functions, how is that different to, um, like, say in that example of burning my finger versus chronic pain? So, you know, I've hurt my lower back, say, more than three months ago, a year ago, two years ago, and now I constantly feel pain in my back with, you know, the smallest of things, trying to um, bend over and pick something up. Uh, I'm worried that I'm going to feel that pain. How do how do we go from experiencing that like normal sort of pain response to having that chronic pain? It's through the process of sensitization of all of those different structures. So um, when we talk about the senses, uh, all of those little nerve endings, they can change and adapt. So they actually only really like live for a couple of days and then they like, you know, new um, sensors regenerate and replace those ones. Now, what can happen is as they keep on um, living, dying and, and then regrowing, they will adapt. So how they will adapt is it'll change thresholds. So what that'll mean is something that used to not cause me pain. So bending over and pick something up is now actually going to cause pain. So that threshold has lowered so that, you know, once I hit that threshold, I start feeling the pain. Um, they can stay open for longer. So that information channel going from our senses to our um, spinal cord, they will stay open for longer and bring in more of that information, more of that pain information. They will also increase in number. And the purpose of doing all of this is our senses are trying to adapt so that it becomes like more efficient at, at um, sending those pain signals to better protect our bodies. So that's like the purpose of it. But what that can lead to is experiencing more of that pain, a higher intensity, whereas previously it wasn't as intense. So it's trying to help us, but a lot of the time it becomes too sensitized and then will prevent us from doing those sort of like day-to-day -day things. And that's essentially, you know, what will happen with chronic pain is like the more we experience that pain, the more the senses will change and then the, the, the easier it is we'll feel that pain. The, the other concept we want to get into though is neurotags. So it's the way that our brain stores information. So what will happen is we'll have this painful experience in a specific situation. So say um, after I've injured my back, I go to pick something up and it hurts. I've, ex I've got this now painful experience in a very specific situation. The brain will then store that information in that memory as a neurotag. And then what will happen is when we're in a similar situation, so say like a week down the road or a month down the road after bend down and pick something up again, it will want to activate and activate more often. And the purpose is to, again, try and protect our bodies. So we, we want to, well, what the brain wants to do is experience that pain to try and protect our bodies because it thinks that it's in danger. Uh, but what happens is it's a lot more efficient at producing pain. So now we've got a couple of things happening. We've got our senses. So like say down at my back or down at my fingers, 
they're changing and adapting and becoming sensitized and sending that pain signal up a lot more often or a lot more intense. But then our brain is also activating those neuro tags more often to help us experience that pain. Um, but what will happen is these things are constantly happening even like months or even years down the road after that initial injury. After that tissue has already healed, the, the senses are still sensitized. The brain is still activating those neuro tags. And then it's preventing us from doing those things that we need to be able to do by trying to protect us when we actually don't need that protection anymore because, you know, that initial injury has healed. So now that we, we actually know what happens with chronic pain, how it changes our nerves and how it changes our brain, how does physiotherapy help manage that? The, one of the main things will be to get moving. Like we have to be able to do those things that we need to be able to do. We need to be able to bend over and pick something up. Um, we need to be able to exercise, but it has to be in a very specific way. It has to be in a really um, specific plan and a graded exposure to those, to those movements. So um, the point of doing that is to be able to get moving without activating the neuro tags. Um, and that's where, you know, going to a physiotherapist, physiotherapist to be able to assess where you're at right now. So, you know, what are you physically capable of doing before experiencing the pain? And then working at that level and then very slowly just increasing that level um, and, and the capacity of what your body is able to do without experiencing pain. The other side of that is understanding all of those things that we talked about just then with how uh, the nerves work and how the brain works, um, really understanding chronic pain and the relationship between pain and activity level. Because what will happen is, you know, as we feel that pain, we're less likely to exercise because, you know, the pain is so terrible. Like we don't want to feel that pain. So we don't exercise because we want to avoid that pain. But then our control gets worse. Our strength becomes worse. Our endurance becomes worse. And that, again, reduces that sort of pain threshold um, in terms of like what we're able to do before we, we, we experience pain. That threshold is a lot lower. So um, you know, doing something really simple and really easy suddenly is causing us a lot of pain. And then the other big thing is just learning the education, uh, learning about all of this, because like I said, it is a relatively complex system and there is a lot to learn and it will take like, you know, a few weeks or a few months of going over it bit by bit, going over points we talked about earlier uh, to really fully understand um, the, the physiology of pain and, and how to manage chronic pain. There are certain things to keep in mind. So, you know, th there's always that um, classic saying in like physio or exercise where it's no pain, no gain, but we do want to allow pain be the guide to a very certain extent. We can't fully let it be the guide because if we did, then we're going back into that cycle of, you know, not doing anything because it's painful and then becoming weaker and then, you know, feeling that pain more and more. We have to be able to take control of that pain and, you know, be able to tell ourselves, tell the brain and tell the body that, you know, bending over to pick something up should not be painful. Um, you know, this is a very simple task and it shouldn't be painful. And what's really interesting is the power of the brain to make a change in how the nerves behave. So if we, we can actually measure pain signals. So, you know, if there's like uh, electrical studies of, you know, this, the electrical signals going through our nerves and up our brain and, you know, what that looks like when you have a pain response, like if I was to, you know, pinch your finger. 
So that pain signal when you have chronic pain is a lot more intense. So say that electrical, the, the number on, a, on an electrical test is going to be a lot higher. Um, but the more you're able to tell yourself that, no, this is a normal um, thing to do, I should not be experiencing pain. Over time, the brain has this ability to tell the nerves that, okay, you guys need to calm down and not be as sensitized. And over time, it will reduce the intensity of that pain signal, which is really amazing. So we do have to take control of that pain, but then, you know, still understand that we will let pain be the guide to a certain extent and not do too much. It has to be that graded exposure to more exercise. So one of the other things to keep in mind is to learn about the physiology of pain will then reduce how threatening it is, how scary it is. So if we understand it, it's not as scary. And if it's not as scary, it won't activate that alarm system as much. Um, so that's why it's so important to, to learn about all of this. Um, third, really important thing to keep in mind throughout a journey of managing chronic pain is if you are hurting or hurting more than normal, it does not mean that your tissue is being injured. So say in that example of uh, hurting my back, um, say if I had a disc bulge and then I'm still experiencing pain like a year later, disc bulges will heal by themselves over time. Like on a scan, this still might look, you know, not ideal, but the the bulge itself, uh, the disc itself has healed. It's, it's thickened, you know, it's not going to bulge more. Um, so the, the injury itself will heal by itself. So if it's hurting, it doesn't necessarily mean that your tissue is being injured. It's about all those other things that I've been talking about with sensitization of the nerves and um, having those neuro tags um, activate more often and, and when we don't want it to. So really important to keep that in mind. So we, we've covered it a little bit about physiotherapy management like sort of traditional physio management. How does virtual reality physiotherapy differ? So the, the main thing is most chronic pain clients wouldn't have tried VR before. And if they haven't tried it before, there's like no neuro tag to associate virtual reality with pain. So we can actually exercise in virtual reality without activating that pain neuro tag. So, for example, you know, we've got a boxing game, you know, something that if you do have a lot of chronic pain, that might be quite difficult. But boxing in a virtual reality world, we don't have that neuro tag and you might be able to do one minute or two minutes without experiencing pain, which is fantastic. We're not activating that neuro tag. And then bit by bit over time, we can increase that time to three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, increase the speed um, and slowly increase that exercise tolerance, the strength and the endurance. And basically reteaching our brain to, to not activate those neuro tags. And then over time, our, our sensitized nerves will slowly become less sensitive. They won't, um, you know, be as open for as long and and send those signals um and and you know they'll slowly decrease in number which is fantastic and that's essentially you know the benefits of virtual reality physio you know it's just completely different to what we've done before um the other huge benefit of using virtual reality is just the fact that it's fun like it's it's not having to go to the gym and pick up some weights and you know, be scared about doing weights. We're playing a fun game in the comfort of our home. And that helps with the consistency. And if you can stay consistent, then you're going to see some results. So and that's one of those added benefits of using virtual reality. Excuse me. So I wanted to show off some of those applications that we do have. Um, this first one is called Balloon Blast. 
So you can see here the the individual has got two swords and they have to swing the sword to pop balloons. And obviously fantastic for if you've got shoulder problems, but also if you do have any back problems, you know, being able to turn and activate your core. And, and, and it's in a way that's not like fully targeting your core. It's doing it in a really like functional way. And again, you know, you're not thinking about how your back is feeling when you're doing this one. Um, another one that I wanted to show you, where is it gone? Ah, this is the boxing game I was talking about. So just hit the dot that lights up. Um, and it can be made more complex with like different colors. So you're thinking about just hitting the correct color and when the color changes. And um, something I didn't mention before is the, the benefits of distraction therapy. You're just fully distracted about thinking about how your pain is, how your back is. You're only focused on the task at hand. And then afterwards you think to yourself, ah, oh, that was actually like really manageable and I didn't feel the pain at all. And again, helps with uh, rewiring that brain. Now, where's that? So as you can see, we've got a lot of different applications around relaxation, which um, would help as well. Uh, but the other thing I want to show you is this one, XRH Fitness. So a lot more intense, a lot more full body movement. That's uh, the red bars are things you have to dodge. And that's when it becomes a lot more of a full body workout, um, which I really loved using as well. And really great at helping with that graded exposure. We've got like warm up songs and more intense songs. And... Oh, yeah. And the next one I wanted to show you is a fantastic application that we have um, on our platform called Reducept. So all of those concepts about how the nerves function, how the brains function, uh, how the brain functions and how we can elicit a change. It's really hard to visualize that sometimes because of how complex it is. So Reducept is fantastic for that because you can actually visualize your nervous system. So here I am traveling along some nerves and those are some pain signals going up and it's really fun. You get to like, you know, blast the pain signals, but at the same time, it's going to help teach you about the physiology of what we just talked about, how the pain travels up the nerves, how it behaves in our spinal cord, how it behaves in our brain, how our brain responds to it. So this is a really fantastic application that, um, you know, if you were to join us um, at XR Health for, you know, managing your chronic pain, you would have access to this. And I'd greatly encourage you to use this application to um, be able to go through all of that content of, you know, what is going on in my body and in my brain, because when I talk about it, it makes sense at the time, but then it's always a little bit hard to recall later on, you know, at the dinner table. Um, so it's nice to be able to reference it in your headset later on. Um, the other benefits to this application is it's also got um, different like pacing strategies and, and management strategies uh, that you can work on as well. So yeah, that was a quick little overview of some of our applications that I would use. Um, I would also, uh, use some of our, like, you know, more traditional physio techniques because it will help teach you some control, um, around your body and then combine it with virtual reality. It's a really fantastic way to, you know, combine, um, the old and the new. So if you, uh, wanted to come over to XR Health, quick referral process, um, is, you know, once we do get a referral, then, uh, we'll get the office to, you know, book you in for initial assessment. And at the initial assessment, we always decide, um, whether or not this is the right fit for you. So, you know, there's contraindications that we'll screen for, and then also just look at what your current function is, what your goals are, and whether or not telehealth and virtual reality is appropriate for you. Like, for example, if you also had 
um, some real issues with like your balance and it was, it was a, a little bit dicey to be doing this by yourself at home without supervision, then we would recommend that you see a physio in person. So that's um, what would be decided at the initial, whether or not VR is appropriate. And then we get into the actual games themselves, you know, find that um, that level to, to start out without activating those neuro tags and experiencing pain and then slowly progressing from there, which is really nice um, to do with a VR headset because we have all of the um, the settings that you've done over time and the stats and be able to check your your um, account on our portal and then be able to really just tweak the settings bit by bit so that we stay um, on this nice little uh, progression. We accept um, NDIS self and plan managed as well as um, Medicare CDMs and of course, private health insurance. Okay, cool. So um, that was a quick run through of, you know, uh, the, the physiology of pain and chronic pain in our nerves, our brain, how physio can help and, and with VR physio. So yeah, if there are any questions, I'd love to hear them and answer whatever comes through. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Tom. Just while everyone's getting their questions in, I've got some here from the past. Um, the first one, so the homework for physio, um, is that exactly the same as face-to-face, -face, just like you would at a normal physio uh, physiotherapist? Would you get homework for the VR therapy as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, like, we're, we're as physios, we're always going to give homework, and there's a reason for that. So, in order to elicit a permanent change in how, or a relatively permanent change in how our muscles work and how our bodies work, you have to essentially do exercise every day for at least three months. And then following that, like every couple of days is good. So that's like a rough time frame on on um, what I would want my clients to do, um, whether that's with me or independently. Um, but the independent side of things, we have a training plan that we set up for our headsets. So all those specific settings that I have for like the balloon blast and color match, like the boxing game, I can set it up. So how many minutes, how fast, um, you know, what mode it's in and then set up a plan for you. So you don't have to play around with the settings. You can just go into your training plan and um, click into today's game and then get started and then tick it off. So a lot easier than having to like read a hand-drawn stick figure sheet like mm. we used to do at private yeah. practices. Definitely, definitely. Um, monitoring the progress. So the remote controls, do they get monitored to measure range of motion? How are they monitored? Yeah, yeah. So like all of our controllers, they've got their internal sensors. And the good thing about it is we can see, like you said, like shoulder range of motion if the issues with your shoulder, but also things like um, what's your speed? Like how fast are you able to hit one of the dots? Um, how smooth are you moving? Um, so that'll just help build that picture of like, are you getting stronger? Is your control getting better? So we are able to like monitor that and track it on a nice graph um, in our portal and, you know, see how you're progressing. Um, yep. So it's a really nice way to visualize how your, your progress. And they can also track the, the monitor their progress as well via the application. Yeah, that's right. So um, you can log into the portal yourself on a browser, um, on our mobile phone app, and be able to check your your progress. Perfect. Um, we've got a question here from Lisa. She asks, for people who would require help and supervision, supervision can independent physios purchase equipment to use with clients? Um, I think that would be a question um, that we could probably meet up and talk about um, outside of the webinar. I, I believe it is a possibility. Um, we have worked with other physios in the past and um, other health professionals, so definitely an option. Perfect. Um, in terms of space for the sessions to go ahead, is there a rough estimate on how much space you would need for the sessions? I would roughly estimate like two by two meters of yeah. some clear space. Yeah, it, it really, you don't need too much room. Um, 
a lot of it actually is relatively stationary when you look at your um like your legs um say with boxing and balloons it's xrh fitness that requires a bit of stepping outside of your your base so that's hence why the two by two but the main thing is like don't be in front of tables and can you like hit the table um but yeah about two by two meters yeah no worries um in terms of the headset so can someone see let's say i've got the headset on i'm doing my session is there any way for someone sitting next to me or you know, further away in a different house to watch what i'm doing yeah, absolutely. Um, so you can cast to a TV. Um, so if you're in the same room, you can do it that way. Um, it'll be in the settings in your headset um, and a guide on how to do that. Uh, the other way is we do have a like casting portal. So just a website that you can log into. It'd be the same credentials that you'd log into with the headset, but you can essentially stream whatever's going on on the headset to your like computer or, or tablet yeah yeah so if a support worker wanted to see what their client was doing they could definitely watch that yeah video. absolutely so um i've had instances of say um clients who are non-verbal uh, <laughs> so then a support worker or a family member is casting and, and seeing what's going on uh, and then that way they're able to to better assist um you know with whatever game we're working on uh, but then also I had a client uh, who was, I believe it was after a car accident and had a brain injury and they were bed bound, but had limited use of their hands and required just a little bit of assistance with some of the higher shoulder movements. And I had a support uh, worker, a carer who was able to watch the screen and then provide a little bit of assistance with the arm to be able to hit the balloons and work on Ooh. that client's range of motion. Um, so yeah, really helpful having uh, the ability to cast for, for our families and, and carers. Yep, definitely. Um, back to nonverbal patients. Uh, how would you, how would VR, how does it work with people that are nonverbal? How does the, how would the session go ahead? It's very dependent on the client, um, of course, you know, and, and their mode of communication. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've had clients who do use assistive devices for communications or, um, or really just, I guess, guidance from the family, the carers, maybe the speech pathologist on how they communicate with the client and for us to just slowly learn that. So mm -hmm. being able to read, facial expressions and tone rather than um, the actual words themselves. You yeah. know, it, it's really just us trying to figure out how to communicate um, yeah. with that person. Yeah. We've got a question here from Beck. She asks, uh, how does XR compare to Oculus VR? I'm not sure about that one. Um, so we, at the moment in Australia, we use a, a headset called the Pico Neo 2. Um, the Oculus Quest 2 would be the main one. I mean, they've got three at the moment, but in terms of hardware, all very similar in terms of like power and graphics, et cetera. The, the main difference is we are using it as a medical device. So our platform uh, combined with the headset makes it a medical device. So we're TGA registered and um, FDA registered over in America. Um, and everything's like in one package, all of our applications um, is all on the headset and we send it out to you. Uh, whereas you wouldn't be able to get um, our, our applications on the Oculus. Yeah. Um, in terms of the actual session going ahead, how would they occur? Do you need a laptop or anything for the video call? Any specific hardware for that video call or just anything with a camera? Oh. Yeah, anything with a camera and then and then internet. Um, so whether it be a phone, tablet, laptop, computer, whatever has a camera for a video call. Um, and then yeah, internet, and then you're all good. Um, obviously, we also need internet for the headset, um, just so that we can you know send updates and be able to to connect to the headset and be able to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... In terms of applications this time, so are there any applications where 
I'm not sure if it's applicable in physio, but where you can see the patient and they can see you in the headset, where you can do certain activities in the room. Yeah, yeah, we've got a couple like that. Um, so we've got a virtual art room, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know our psychologists really like using it and our occupational therapists really like using it. Um, so you both meet in this virtual space and you can create artwork in this virtual space uh, and both experience it. Um, another one we can meet is Connect. It's like a virtual meeting room. Um, so we, we've had social skills groups and education groups, say around chronic pain, uh, where a lot of us meet in Connect and you've got a 3D avatar that represents you, which is fantastic. No. Um, some questions that we get commonly as well. So can we use our own headset? Uh, no, unfortunately. Um, so like I was saying earlier, it all comes on the, the Pico Neo 2 that we send out to everyone. Um, so you wouldn't be able to download our, our stuff onto your headset. Yeah. Um, and let's say we had someone age 14 and their parent was signing them up. Would they need to be present during the sessions when they're going ahead? Uh, certainly for the initial assessment, um, a lot of the time, you know, our parents have a, a lot of that detail that we need. Um, and the first virtual reality um, appointment is also ideal. Um, other than that, though, I think just being in the home is enough. So if we need you, then we can we can get assistance or, um, yeah, just being in another room don't necessarily need to be in the room. Um, so I know there are a lot of like young teenagers who would prefer to to be in a session by themselves, which is okay as long as the parents are okay with that as well. Um, but yeah, definitely not not necessary, but certainly for the first couple is, is ideal. Yeah. Um, also just one thing, just let everyone know, we do have immediate uh, capacity for OT, psychology and physiotherapy. Um, so yeah, just... So everyone can know that as well. Um, and feel free to get all of your questions in. We'll go through them. I think we got one here. Uh, what are the costs to hire or purchase the XR if you feel the client is able to independently use the device? Yeah, cool. Um, so while the client is seeing us um, for, for appointments, uh, if they're seeing uh, one of our services weekly, then uh, the headset has no hire fee. Um, if they are seeing one of our services less than weekly, so say fortnightly or monthly, the headset hire fee is one thirty five per month. Yep. And um, if say, so I always recommend that people are with us for a little while. Um, so say, you know, a couple months uh, to really understand and, and feel, you know, is this something that they want to do long-term at which point they can decide to purchase a headset which at the moment is $660. Yeah. Perfect. Um, in terms of other therapies, so let's say OT, how does physio and OT differ between the two? Mm, very good question. Um, I would say physios, we are all about um, getting people moving better. Um, but it's getting people moving better by looking at why they're not moving the way that they want to move um, and then giving them exercises and education to help them move better. Uh, whereas occupational therapy, oh, such a broad sort of area and outside of my um, expertise, they're not going to be working on um, necessarily exercises to help them move better unless it's say hand therapy or arm therapy. They, they certainly would do a lot of that, um, but they're going to look at, a whole bunch of different things, um, you know, modifying activities or, um, you know, getting equipment um, or looking at the more cognitive side of things, uh, you know, short-term memory and problem solving. Um, some OTs specialize in emotional regulation as well. Um, so OT is a very broad sort of area, whereas I can sort of simplify physio as we help people move better. And then, of course, there are subspecialties like neurological and geriatric and um, rehab, but essentially we help people move better. Yeah. 
Um, so we talked about chronic pain. Is there any major area other than chronic pain that physiotherapy and exercise health could help with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of different areas. Um, certain kinds of neurological rehab, like post-stroke um, or you know post-brain uh, injury, um, you know we can help with general fitness, strengthening, endurance, coordination um helping with proprioception so these might be for people who are um you know just a little bit weaker than what they would like to be because you know they can't focus on doing uh a sport or or doing exercises or yeah. um you know something that's quite common is um autistic kids they aren't as interested in sports or they don't quite like it because of the the heat and the sweating sensation if they have some um some issues with with you know feeling those things um and yeah we help them get stronger um uh, also you know people who have hypermobility or ellis danlos syndrome um uh, you know we see a lot of different people yeah um in terms of asd we spoke about that could you go into a little bit more detail about how that can help with physiotherapy Oh, yeah. Um, if you really want a lot of detail, we've got a physio um, and and how we help autistic individuals. Uh, we've got a webinar on that, so there's a recording for it. If you'd like, um, please send us an, e an email or a call and we can send that link out to you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, common, common things with our uh, autistic population is uh, reduced endurance and strength um bit of clumsiness uh, so decreased coordination so we can help with all of those things uh yeah yep um also one for more so ot do we do functional capacity assessments yes like yeah we definitely have ot's who do functional capacity assessments uh so we can definitely assist with that yeah um let's say someone was going to physiotherapy face-to-face -face. could they do both XR health and face-to-face -face physiotherapy at the same time alternating or would you prefer just once a week one yeah we week? can we can absolutely do that we've got clients who currently do that as well um so if you're paying privately obviously that's not a problem if it's ndis sometimes they're a bit funny about it but um the main thing is we're focusing on different things we've got different goals uh so the the in-person physio is going to be doing something different uh to what i am um so once we explain that then the ndis are, are pretty good about it um but yeah absolutely and it's always good to to have a chat with the current physio and see how we can work together more efficiently as well yeah no worries um if there are any more questions we'll be happy to go through them um like Tung yeah, said please send them through i'd yeah. love to get more questions <laughs> Also, if you do have any questions after the webinar, you can email that email that you see on the screen or just give us a call and yeah, we'd be happy to help you. We also will be uh, sending a recording of the webinar in, I believe, two or three days after this. So yeah, if anyone has missed, they can watch the recording, but do get your questions in. We still do have some time here. Um, one mini question that I've had a couple of times, um, if we do have glasses on, can we still use the VR headset? Yeah, I do as well. <laughs> So I have glasses for short-sightedness. Um, I definitely tell people to use them with glasses first. So the the face hole is really big in the headset so that you mm -hmm. can fit glasses in there. Oh, a bit hard to see. There you go. In terms of the headset, what, would you say it's a bit wide? Would you say it's easy to use? How would you say it's um, in terms of functionality there? Yeah, super easy to use, really. Um, that's what I'm looking for. Intuitive is what I'm looking for. Um, and there's an introductory tutorial that will teach you about the controls and, and how to how to use it. Mm -hmm. Yep. No worries. Um, any more questions? We'd be happy to go through them. Um, just some common questions again that we had. Um, when does the headset get sent out? So I think you said the initial consult. I think you mentioned it, but just to make sure. Yeah, at the initial consultation, once we've decided uh, whether or not this is the right fit for you and mm -hmm. that you're cleared, like based on our contraindications, then um, we 
inform the office. They send it out, hopefully, um, if it's an early appointment that day, um, otherwise the next business day. Um, and then sometimes we might need like GP clearance if you've got a contraindication that we just want to be sure that it's okay. Um, then as soon as we get that GP clearance, again, we inform the office and they'll send it out. Yeah. Uh, just one more common one that we get. What is the minimum age to attend? Uh, minimum age is 10. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And for anyone under the age of 10, between 6 and 10, we do offer telehealth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No worries. If there are no more questions, we could end it there. Like I said, if you do have questions uh, tonight or tomorrow or anytime, just send us an email um, or give us a call. I think... That's all the questions we have, if there are any more final ones. Um, did you have anything else to add, Tom? Uh, no, that, thanks everyone for, for joining us this evening. Um, you know, if you feel like you know, we can help you in your chronic pain journey, or you know of someone that does have chronic pain, please uh, tell them about us, send, the, send them the webinar link. Um, you know, something that they haven't tried before and maybe they've tried everything. So it's always worth trying something new. Uh, yep. We've got someone asking for send out the recording. Yeah, we will send the recording, I think, in two or three days via email. So do check your email, I should say, in the subject recording of the webinar. Um, and it's just a link to the webinar and you can uh, watch it when you're free. Um, so, yeah, two or three days that should be sent out, hopefully. But, yeah. Thank you all for attending. If there are no more questions, we'll end it there. Like I said, any more questions, email or call, um, 9 a.m. till 7 p.m. Happy to answer any more questions. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you in our next webinar. Thank you. Have a good night.